Radical Agriculture by Murray Bookchin, written 1972, recorded by Sen Naomi Kirschultz, 515 2022, originally found on theanarchistlibrary.org. Agriculture is a form of culture. The cultivation of food is a social and cultural phenomenon unique to humanity. Among animals, anything that could remotely be described as food cultivation appears ephemerally, if at all. And even among humans, agriculture developed little more than 10,000 years ago. Yet, in an epoch when food cultivation is reduced to a mere industrial technique, it becomes especially important to dwell on the cultural implications of modern, quote-unquote, agriculture, to indicate their impact not only on public health but also on humanity's relationship to nature and the relationship of human to human. The contrast between early and modern agricultural practices is dramatic. Indeed, it would be very difficult to understand the one through the vision of the other, to recognize that they are united by any kind of cultural con continuity. Nor can we ascribe this contrast merely to differences in technology. Our agricultural epoch, a distinctly capitalistic one, envisions food cultivation as a business enterprise to be operated strictly for the purpose of generating profit in a market economy. From this standpoint, land is an alienable commodity called real estate, soil a natural resource, and food an exchange value that has bought and sold impersonably through a medium called money. Agriculture, in effect, differs no more from any branch of industry than does steelmaking or automobile production. In fact, to the degree that food cultivation is affected by non-industrial factors such as climatic and seasonal changes, it lacks the exactness that marks a truly rational and scientifically managed operation. Unless these natural factors elude bourgeoisie manipulation, they too are the objects of speculation in future markets and between middlemen in the circuit from farm to retail outlet. In this impersonal domain of food production, is it not surprising to find that a farmer often turns out to be an airplane pilot who dusts his crops with pesticides, a chemist who treats soil as a lifeless repository for inorganic compounds, an operator of immense agricultural machines who is more familiar with engines than with botany, and perhaps most decisively, a financier whose knowledge of land may be less than that of an urban cab driver. Food, in turn, reaches the consumer in containers and in forms so highly modified and denatured as to bear scant resemblance to the original. In the modern, glistening supermarket, the buyer walks dreamily through a spectacle of packaged materials in which the pictures of plants, meat, and dairy foods replace the life forms from which they are derived. The fetish assumes the form of the real phenomenon. Here, the individual's relationship to one of the most intimate of natural experiences the nutriments, indispensable to life, is divorced from its roots in the totality of nature. Vegetables, fruits, cereals, dairy foods, and meat lose their identity as organic realities and often acquire the name of the corporate enterprise that produces them. The Big Mac, for example, and the Swift Sausage no longer convey even the faintest notion that a living creature was painfully butchered to provide the consumer with that food. This denatured outlook stands sharply at odds with an earlier animistic sensibility that viewed land as an inalienable, almost sacred domain. Food cultivation as a spiritual activity and food consumption as a hollowed social ritual. The chaoses of the Northwest were not unique in listening to the ground for the great spirit, in the words of a Cayuse chief, appointed the roots to feed the Indians on. The ground lived and its voice had to be heeded. Indeed, this vision may have been a cultural obstacle to the spread of food cultivation. There are few statements of the hunter against agriculture that are more moving than Smohala's memorable remarks. Quote, you ask me to plow the ground? Shall I take a knife and tear my mother's breast? Then when I die, she will not take me to her bosom to rest. Unquote. When agriculture did emerge, it clearly perpetuated the hunter's animistic sensibilities. The wealth of mythic narrative that surrounds food cultivation is testimony to an enchanted world brimming with life, purpose, and spirituality. Ludwig Feuerbach's notion of God as the projection of man omits the extent to which 
early man is stamped by the imprint of the natural world, and in this sense is an extension or projection of it. To say that early humanity lived in partnership with this world tends to understate the case. Humanity lived as a part of this world, not beside or above it. Because the soil was alive, indeed the mother of life, to cultivate it was a sacred act that required invocatory and appeasing rituals. Virtually every aspect of the agricultural procedure had its sanctifying dimension, from preparing a tithe, a tilth, to harvesting a crop. The harvest itself was blessed, and to break bread was at once a domestic ritual that daily affirmed the solidarity of kinfolk as well as an act of hospitable pacification between the stranger and the community. We still seal a bargain with a drink or celebrate an important event with a feast. To fell a tree or kill an animal required appeasing rites, which acknowledge that life inherited in these beings and that this life partook of a sacred constellation of phenomena. Naive as the myths and many of these practices may seem to the modern mind, they reflect a truth about the agricultural situation. <coughs> After having lost contact with this pre-scientific sensibility, at great cost to the fertility of the land and to its ecological balance, we now know that soil is very much alive, that it has its health, its dynamic equilibrium, and a complexity comparable to that of any living community. Not that the details that enter into this knowledge are new, rather we are aware of them in a new and holistic way. As recently as the early 1960s, American agronomy generally viewed soil as a medium in which living organisms were largely extraneous to the chemical management of food cultivation. Having saturated the soil with nitrates, insecticides, herbicides, and an appalling variety of toxic compounds, we have become the victims of a new type of pollution that could well be called soil pollution. These toxins are the hidden additives to the dinner table the unseen specters that return to us as the residual products of our exploitative attitude towards the natural world. No less significantly, we have gravely damaged soil in vast areas of the earth and reduced it to the simplified image of the modern scientific viewpoint. The animal and plant life so essential to the development of a nutritive, friable soil is diminished and in many places approaches the sterility of impoverished desert-like sand. By contrast, early agriculture, despite its imaginary aspects, defined humanity's relationship to nature within sound ecological parameters. As Edward Hiams observes, the attitude of people and their culture is as much a part of their technical equipment as are the implements they employ. If the axe was only the physical tool which ancient man used to cut down trees, and the quote-unquote intellectual tool enabled him to swing his axe effectively, well then what of the spiritual tool? This tool is the member of the trinity of tools which enables people to control and check their actions by reference to the feeling which they possess for the consequences of the changes they make in their environments. Accordingly, tree felling would have been limited by their state of mind as early people believed that trees had souls and were worshipful and they associated certain gods with certain trees. Osiris was associated with acacia, Apollo with the oak and apple, the temples of many primitive peoples were groves. If the mythical aspects of this mentality were evident enough, the fact remains that the mentality as such was immensely valuable to the soil community and therefore, in the long run, to man. It meant that no trees would be wantonly felled, but only when it was absolutely necessary, and then to the accompaniment of proprietary rights, which, if they did nothing else, served constantly to remind tree fellers that they were doing dangerous and important work. One may add that if culture could be regarded as a tool, a mere shift in emphasis would easily make it possible to regard tools as of culture. This different emphasis comes closer to what Hiams is trying to say than does his own formulation. In fact, what uniquely marks the bourgeoisie mentality is the debasement of art, values, and rationality to mere tools, a mentality that has even infiltrated the radical critique of capitalism, if one is to judge from the tenor of the Marxian literature that abounds today. A radical approach to agriculture seeks to transcend the prevailing instrumentalist approach that views food cultivation merely as a human technique opposed to natural resources. 
This radical approach is literally ecological in the strict sense that the land is viewed as an oikos, a home. Land is neither a resource nor a tool, but the oikos of myriad kinds of bacteria, fungi, insects, earthworms, and small mammals. If hunting leaves this oikos essentially undisturbed, agriculture, by contrast, affects it profoundly and makes humanity an integral part of it. Human beings no longer indirectly affect the soil. They intervene into its food webs and biogeochemical cycles directly and immediately. Conversely, it becomes a very difficult to understand human social institutions without referring to the prevailing agricultural practices of a historical period and ultimately to the soil situation to which they apply. Hiem's description of every human community as a soil community is unerring historically. <clears throat> historically, soil types and agrarian technological changes played a major, often decisive role in determining whether the land would be worked cooperatively or individualistically, whether in a conciliatory manner or an exploitative one. And this, in turn, profoundly affected the prevailing system of social relations. The highly centralized empires of the ancient world were clearly fostered by the irrigation works required for arid regions of the Near East. The cooperative medieval village, by the open field strip system and the mold board plow, Lynn White Jr., in fact, roots the western coercive attitude towards nature as far back as Carolingian times with the ascendancy of the heavy European plow and the consequent tendency to allot land to peasants, not according to their family subsistence needs, but in proportion to their contribution to the plow team. He finds this changing attitude reflected in Charlemagne's efforts to rename the months according to labor responsibilities, thereby revealing an emphasis on work rather than on nature or deities. Quote, the old Roman calendars had occasionally shown genre scenes in human activity, but the dominant tradition, which continued in Byzantium, was to depict the months as passive personifications bearing symbols of attributes. The new Carolingian calendars, which set the pattern for the Middle Ages, are very different. They show a coercive attitude towards natural resources. They are definitely northern in origin, for the olive which loomed so large in the Roman cycles has now vanished. The pictures change to scenes of plowing, harvesting, wood chopping, people knocking down acorns for the pigs, pig slaughtering. Man and nature are now two things, and man is its master. Unquote. Yet not until we come to the modern capitalist era do humanity and nature separate as almost complete foes, and the mastery by human over the natural world assumes the form of harsh domination, not merely hierarchical classification. The rupture of the most vestigial corporate ties that once united clans folk, guildsmen, and the fraternity of the polis into a nexus of mutual aid, the reduction of everyone to an antagonistic buyer or seller, the rule of competition and egotism in every arena of economic and social life, all of this completely dissolves any sense of community, whether with nature or in society. The traditional assumption that community is the authentic locus of life fades so completely from human consciousness that it ceases to exercise any relevance at all to the human condition. The new starting point for forming a conception of society or of the psyche is the isolated, atomized man fending for himself in a competitive jungle. The disastrous consequences of this outlook toward nature and society are evident enough in a world burdened by explosive social antagonisms ecological simplification, and widespread pollution. This has been part one of Radical Agriculture by Murray Bookchin. Stay tuned for part two.